Good evening. Well, maybe good afternoon for some. I welcome you to Recruitment and Retention Roadmap for Equity in Education. For Walden University's Continuing Talks for Good series, our panel of experts will discuss the challenges and potential solutions to support a more equitable and racially diverse world of education that prioritizes development and retention just as much as recruitment. Now, I know that the topic of race can be uncomfortable for some, but these conversations are very much so needed. And the output should be worthwhile for all of you um, who tuned in today. There's still work to be done and the small increases across the nation still aren't where we need to be as of yet. I mean, there's hope in seeing many teachers of color aren't just becoming teachers, but they're also becoming administrators. So now I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists and ask them to introduce themselves. Julia? Hello, I'm Julia Torres. I am a librarian and language arts teacher in Denver, Colorado. I have been a teacher since 2005, and I am also very blessed to be a part of the EduColor Steering Committee. I am an Amelia Elizabeth Walden Award Committee member, a Book Love Foundation board member, and I really enjoy a lot of the work that I do with young people in connecting them with the perfect book. That's the thing that gives me the most joy right now. So um, I'm honored to be here with all of you and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jose. Hello everyone, my name is Jose Wilson. I've been uh, in education for the last 17 years. For the first 15, I taught in Washington Heights as a middle school math teacher. Uh, that's Washington Heights, New York City. And now I am a doctoral student at Teachers College, Columbia University, studying uh, sociology and education. And also, I am the executive director of EduColor, which is an organization dedicated to race and social justice issues. Um, and I'm also on the board of the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards and the power of my learning. Uh, I'm so glad to be part of this conversation specifically because this is part of our passion work and the work that we must do to save uh, not just uh, public education, but also just our students writ large, especially our most marginalized students. All right. Thank you, Jose. Damon Harris. Hello, everyone. I'm Damon Harris. I'm the principal of Wheaton Woods Elementary School in Rockville, Maryland, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C. Uh, well, that serves pre-K to fifth grade students. I'm also the co-founder and co-leader of the Building Our Network of Diversity Project, or the BOMB Project, which is a Maryland-based nonprofit which advocates and programs for efforts to recruit retain, develop, and empower men of color in education. So I've been in the profession since 1996, doing one job or another, um, as from a teacher to an administrator to an instruct, uh, district level coach, a building level coach. I'm an adjunct instructor for the University of Maryland College Park with uh, teaching methods in graduate school. And I'm also a adjunct lecturer for McDaniel College in their equity and excellence in education program. I'm so happy to be here listening to my colleagues and, and Kelly, I'm, I'm, I can't wait to get started. All right, all right, Dr. Harris, let's get started. All right, Damon, Julia, Jose, how about we start this discussion um, by acknowledging the precursor to retention and development, and that's recruitment. And there are so many myths and misconceptions around recruitment. So I want us to start by asking each of our panelists, what does it mean to recruit, to, excuse me, to recruit teachers of color? And more specifically, I'm going to say black and Latino teachers of color. And why is it important to you personally and professionally? So I'll start with you, Julia. Ooh, so that is a very big question. And mm -hmm. as I think about my journey as an educator, I started off teaching in Park City, Utah. 
So a lot of folks don't know this, but I was the only black teacher for miles. And they put me on the cover of the park record in, I think, I want to say probably 2006, maybe, um, maybe 2007, but clear tokenization at that point, you know? In my mind, I just thought, oh, I'm just new to teaching and they just think I'm fabulous. But, you know, in that particular moment, it was there were no efforts made to recruit educators of color. They just happened to find the one that was there for miles around and they got me and I was at Park City High School and at a middle school called Treasure Mountain International School. And then from there, I went to the suburbs in Denver, Colorado, and I was at a high school that was had a predominantly white student population. And when I was hired, I was told very clearly, we need some representation. Once again, I was the only black teacher in the district at that time. Yeah. So that was strange. And I can tell you what led me to leave that environment, I'll never forget it, was a moment when I was the only one advocating for the autobiography of Malcolm X. And lots of folks were saying that they did not feel comfortable teaching that book because, you know, there were a variety of reasons, but I think we know why. But most folks just would flat out say, I don't feel comfortable teaching that book. There was one teacher who was willing to go there and teach it with me, but the majority of the folks that I was teaching with at that time were not racially competent or aware or ready to, to advocate for books that centered people of color. Um, that were not about the victimization, right, of people of color. Mm -hmm. From there, I went to Denver Public Schools, which makes a very deliberate effort to reach out to educators of color. And there are lots of programs. We have something called DPS Belong, which has all of these little affinity subgroups for folks to get with like-minded people. And I remember the person who recruited me saying, it's not gonna be the children that are gonna be the issue. You are going to have adult issues and that'll be something that probably never goes away. And I still know that woman today. She is a, um, she's in the equity department within DPS, but it's been an interesting journey to go from a predominantly white, very small district in the mountains in Utah to come to Denver where folks, I think in a lot of the country, think that there are no black or brown people in Denver or there aren't very many, but there are lots of us. And you know, Denver Public School just has the highest concentration. So the journey has been long and I can speak more later about you know, what the retention rates are like in each one of those environments and the personal challenges that I have faced but it's been it's been very interesting to experience, you know, a very small district, a very large district and then a medium sized suburban one and what that's like to be an educator of color in each of those spaces. OK, thanks, Julia. Damon, um, I want to ask you the same question when it comes down to the recruitment of teachers of color or, as I said, more specifically, um, black, brown, Latino. Um, teachers, why is it important to you personally and professionally to, I would say, purposefully recruit them? Yeah, so two sentences that we use at Bond that sort of distill our our vision down into like the simplest form is if schools were better places for children of color, then more of them would want to become teachers. Mm. And if schools were better places for adults of color, then more of them would want to stay teachers. And if school districts want that to occur, if they want, if they legitimately want to create a larger cadre of, of folks of color in their workforces, then they need to create institutional environments in which teachers of color can thrive and then go out and invite those teachers of color into their spaces in ways that make them feel like it's their space, they're their, their spaces as well. So like sometimes that that invitation can look like relationships with HBCUs or with Hispanic serving institutions or minority serving institutions. 
But other times it could look like it, it, it's the traditional hosting job fairs and marketing on social media and listservs and stuff. But the one that is, I think, will is where a lot of folks are starting to orient themselves. A lot of school districts now is or grow your own places. So that might mean that you're growing your program where students or non-certified staff within your districts will be able to start um, moving in that direction to become a part of the, the certified workforce. Oftentimes districts do that in reverse, where they try to hurry up and run out and grab some teachers, tokenize, like I just heard Julia say, and then start to ask them, okay, are we done? Is this, do you absolve us of, of our sins, so to speak, for not working harder to, to make this happen? Or we wanna bring people in, but we need to bring them in in ways that make them feel comfortable. And this sort of work is, is personal to me because I've been an elementary school teacher where I wasn't the only one in the school district, but where I was the only black man in the building. And it's isolated. And I've seen this as a teacher and now as a, a building leader, as an administrator, and trying to create inclusive spaces where everybody feels like not only that, that they belong, but that they're needed and that we are searching for you. You belong here with us. And I used to think just the last six homeroom teachers, I believe that we hired a special education teacher, five of them have been teachers of color. No, that's not true. Of the last seven, five of them have been teachers of color. And the ones who have joined us said, I saw you and I heard you talk about how this work is important, how having a diverse workforce is important, and I want to be a part of that work. Other people said, I Googled your name and saw this come up in some of the first uh, websites that I hit. Still others said, I know a person who vouched for you and said that this is a place where folks can feel comfortable and folks can be their authentic selves and still grow as, as educators and as people. So I think that we are moving in the right direction in my building. And this is why this work is important to me or personal to me. All right, thank you, Dan. Jose, my question, same question for you about recruiting um, teachers of color and why it's important to you personally or professionally. Well, I would say professionally, there's a, a myriad of benefits. We understand that teachers of color are uh, beneficial for all students, but they are particularly uh, beneficial for all uh, students of color, especially in spaces where you do have um, more economic and racial disparities. So we understand, for instance, that uh, teachers of color are more likely to um, elevate students of color to uh, high I guess AP and different honors type classes, they're more likely to have an impact on student attendance. They're more likely to uh, create equitable conditions for discipline. Um, <laughs> they, they're actually more likely to uh, have this conversation that we keep trying to avoid in this country by actually trying to hold folks accountable. And of course, historically, we understand the role of teachers uh, throughout any number of different social uh, justice movements to uh, implicitly and explicitly ensure that students got an equitable education. So like there's a plethora of benefits. And of course, uh, we understand too that it's really difficult to do so at this time because our system has not constructed a uh truly viable uh, profession for most educators of color and those of us who do make it through the ranks whether you know we're uh, black or brown or whatever it is that your background is it's it becomes that much harder to stay in the profession um as specifically to be recruiting the the profession if you don't have that generational wealth so we'll focus on that part from on a professional standpoint however i also recognize too that as a black man who is, does uh have origins in the Dominican Republic and Haiti, I recognized immediately that my students uh, were able to gravitate towards me, not just because of what I looked at on the outside, but also because of the implicit and explicit cultural understandings I had coming into the profession already. So uh, I did not have to explain um, <laughs> things around language, for example, and using uh, different languages, English, Spanish. We call that code switching in some places, but really it was just a matter of uh, translanguaging. 
There are things I didn't have to, uh, you know, be taught around their own languages, their own cultures. There are things that uh, I was able to connect to when it came to family relationships, uh, whether it be religion or uh, their own neighborhoods and where they were residing. There were things that um, I was able to translate for them mathematically that made it easier for them to grasp the concept because I already had that cultural connection, that social connection. And of course, it is worth uh, it reiterating by by the way, that it's not enough to just change the faces of the people who are in front. The reason why you want to uh, have more educators of color, whether they be specifically black or brown, is not to change the face of the folks who uh, manage the ship. It is to change the entire ship's direction and make sure it goes in the right direction, especially for our children who end up being um, the, the the largest population in the student body. So uh, I think black, brown, and Asian students make up the vast the majority of our public school system right now and so we want to make sure that we have at least some form of uh demographic shift when it comes to the teaching profession because there, there is a benefit to having more educators of color who are able to uh, better connect to what's happening with our students and with their communities and in those classrooms so the more we can do that the better thank you jose and that takes me right into our next question and that is, you know, what, why would you say it's so important for students to see Black and Latino representation in their teachers and their administrators? And I'll start with you, Damon. I think that folks have shown that there are there are connections to achievement and well-being outcomes that are related to not just for students of color, but also for all students when they have a diverse teaching core. So we think that it's, it's important for, for that reason, but also students, students feel like they can be their authentic, their authentic selves and they thrive in environments where they can be their authentic selves, like Jose just, just named earlier. Sometimes those things are, are not really about that. Well, just like Jose said, not about the outside, but it's a, a shared set of experiences that they can sort of connect with almost automatically. And once you, you get a space where folks feel like they are connected to each other, but to their, to their, um, to their instructors, the the sky's the limit for kids in their learning. Okay. Thank you. If I one one other quick oh, thing. Oh sure, go ahead. Sure. So, like, you you also need. I think Julia spoke to this earlier. Also, you also need a diversity of thought in the school building leadership, in the school district leadership, and even at the grade level team conversations. So you need to have conversations about how we interact with our our students' parents. We need to interact about what we what we choose for the curricula we use, what instructional methods we're going to try with students, the the messaging that we give the students implicitly um, or or explicitly. Like those things are made clearer when you have a, a greater number of folks or more diverse group of folks who are having those conversations who are sitting at that table. Okay, thank you, Damon, Julia. Same same question for you. Why is it important that our students see, um, our Black and Latino students see, um, Black and Latina administrators and teachers? Why so do you in my that? school, the majority of the staff, I would say it's probably like 60-40. Um, and that would be Black and Latino teachers and um, discipline and behavior, which really should be called restorative justice folks, but the, the name changes all the time. We had a phenomenal um, student resource officer named Officer Henry, who I cared very dearly for, but Denver passed a no cops in schools resolution. So he was, he's not on our campus anymore. For the longest time, though I understand the need for that no cops in schools resolution. For the longest time though, Officer Henry was the only person between the system and many kids, between the parents who didn't really understand how to advocate for their children and the system. 
Um, I know that one, uh, I've been very blessed. I was taught Spanish as a baby, so I have grown up speaking Spanish. I grew up in a bilingual home. And one of the blessings that that affords me is that I'm able to do parent-teacher conferences in two languages. And I can go back and forth. And so this, the student doesn't have to be the one that's translating because in many places, the burden is placed on the student of being the one to translate. And sometimes it can have kind of a funny outcome when they don't know that I speak Spanish necessarily and they're saying things and that's not exactly what what's really going down. And so I have to, you know, tell the parent in Spanish, this is actually the case, not what your, your child told you. And I will add too that I'm a librarian and you may know that librarianship, especially school librarianship is over 90% white and the majority of them are white women. And so one of the great things about being a school librarian is that I it is intuitive for me to purchase books in multiple languages. It is intuitive for me to purchase and have multiple copies and run book clubs about the anti-racist texts. It is intuitive for me to share with young people the career path of being an author or a librarian themselves if they're interested in it. So a lot of times my student helpers have considered the path of librarianship, which maybe they wouldn't if they didn't see somebody who looks like them doing that work. So, you know, I absolutely love the idea of what people call a culture worker, somebody who is out there using whatever creative gifts they've been given to transform the world around them. And I know that many of our young students identifying as people of color or people of the global majority could grow up to be what Amanda Gorman calls um, change makers who are out here changing the world. She says change sinks. And I know that they could do that, but they need to be surrounded with people who are immersed in or knowledgeable about that work and who believe that they can be creative too, not just learn to write to pass a test, you know, but you can learn for creative expression and for the possibility of making change in our world. Thank you, Julia. Jose, same question for you. You kind of led into this, so I don't know if you wanted to add a little bit more or I, I think I thank you for this because I think what it also makes me think about too um, is this idea that we fully understand that you know <laughs> our our country and our public education system is often hostile to this idea of trying to recruit more educators of color if we're being honest with ourselves uh, as i'm looking at some of the informal studies i'm doing which are going to be formal at some point but i recognize that when you look at uh, specific school districts the you know the big school districts you talk about new york city talk about los angeles miami uh so on uh clark county that would be um in Nevada, Las Vegas, etc. There's a lot of uh, spaces where there's a bunch of educators of color. Like you look at Detroit, for example, and I think it's over 50% black, if I'm not mistaken. But then once you start looking at the suburban areas right around there, you start seeing even in the single digits educators of color, which is to say that a lot of the issues that we were discussing with respect to uh, segregation, redlining, uh, voter suppression are intricately connected to this issue of trying to recruit educators of color. Like there is no doubt about it. If you have, for example, a school district like Anana, that is, I don't know, I think it's 50 plus percent um, black teachers, right? And that ends up being a space that is uh, trying to back an initiative around schools. And you know, you look at that space, you say, oh, like that's the space I need to target to make sure that there's less educators of color, black teachers specifically, trying to organize and build for their communities. Because what people often don't understand is that when you are fully activated as a black teacher or as a Latinx teacher who's trying to go back to the community, you're fully trying to connect to the communities that you serve. Like there is an extra level. Uh, so for instance, I know so many of us uh, who have been in the classrooms or have been in schools usually live a lot closer uh, to the school that we serve than our white counterparts. Like that's a thing uh, that I've also noticed too, which uh, that's informal, but hopefully it'll become formal at some point. Understanding that community connection is critical and vital to ensuring that students feel like they belong in the schools that are often uh, against that which is their dream, that which is their hope. And so when you have a teacher uh, such as myself, such as Julia, just as Damon, 
folks who actually fully believe in the power of students, then it, it allows for students to also feel free like they can cultivate their own thinking and their own dreams and their own visions. Like even within the curriculum that doesn't reflect them, when you have uh, instruction that often doesn't reflect the desires, you have a discipline binary code that all, that it pro disproportionately comes up against them. When you have teachers who are fully invested in those communities, and they could be of any color, surely, but it, when we look at the research, it's more likely to be the black teacher, the Latinx teacher, right? Um, those of us who are about that life, <laughs> we are so critical and like a lifeline for so many of the kids who really want to stay, be in school, stay in school and continue to pursue their education because where that's where the push out often happens. Hey, Kelly, if I could, if I could just add one quick thing, Absolutely. It, is, it is if the students, because what Julia and Jose triggered to start with me, if the students don't see themselves uh -huh. in the curriculum, uh -huh. They don't see themselves in the school district leadership. Then they have to see themselves somewhere in order to invest. Yes. So and now that means that doesn't mean that you have. I saw someone ask the question in the in the chat about is this, does this mean we need to have quotas and, and ratios? I'm not saying that, mm -hmm. but we but we should be having these conversations everywhere. We should be trying to figure this out everywhere and that that's and that's that's exactly it I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions in the chat and i want to you know kind of move through our questions because i'm looking at some of these questions and some of them are quite interesting and let's see okay let's move on to another one of um the questions that we have because i think this one right here and then maybe you know if we have enough time you know we can go into some of the um questions in the chat and i'll just you know let you guys you know scroll through the chat to see if you know there's one that you you know want to address instead of me just you know picking one and just say but th this is why we're here I, I you know how do we create a solution um you know for the inequities in retention and development it's just like of our teachers and you know how do we create this lasting fr framework so other schools can get it right so you know i think this is what everybody you know wants to know what is this framework and jose i'll start with you now if if i'm wrong correct me but you were um once a teacher correct 15 years yes ma'am okay and then you you left the profession you left the classroom and so can you talk to us a little bit about why you left the well, profession? i'm glad you asked i mean i've obviously still been in the education field one of the things that people must understand is that you know when it comes to teachers whether they stay they go whatever that may be uh those of us who are again about that life those of us who are black teachers latinx teachers so on and so forth when i speak to any number of them and i get to speak to about 100 plus a, a year i think if not more uh, what i end up finding out is that we don't leave because of children it's definitely not the children it is most likely going to be the adults and specifically our frustrations with decisions that are made above our pay grade and so uh for me i found it uh <laughs> i found it wild that i had to step out of the classroom to feel like i had more control over my own profession and the professional decisions i wanted to make especially with respect to transforming education for the kids that i was trying to serve uh in no way shape or form was it ever about the, the students in terms of me leaving which kind of lines up a little bit with what we see in the research already anyway so i would say out of the top five uh reasons why teachers leave they're actually pretty alike whether it be uh the teacher profession overall or black teachers latinx teachers etc usually it is about pay i mean there's that's one part but it's more likely administrative decisions that makes it harder for us to stay in the classroom and of course like we we could look at the studies as well we see that teachers at this point um when it comes to the teaching diversity, we are recruiting at the highest percentage we've ever recruited in this country, ever, right? And that's some of the research that's been done since 1980 something, 1986, since they started recording this. But we also noticed too that teachers of color are leaving 
quicker than their white counterparts. And so much of this has to do with how f- people feel when they are in the classrooms. A lot of what you see when you know you have students, going right back to Damon's point, if you have students who go into the teaching profession thinking that uh, they're gonna change that space and then they get re-traumatized because some of those things haven't changed and that environment hasn't changed. They don't feel like they're, they're the ones that they can change it, that that becomes a problem. So uh, for me, I felt like if I didn't do my best to at least try to think systemically about these things with the 15 plus years that I've had in the classroom, then it, 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 it was a disservice to the community that I served. And so that it was critical for me to dive right in to how we can best solve these systemic situations that are happening all across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Damon, um, you mentioned that you lead Bond and you get to see what type of teachers are coming and you know, leaving your county. And I think you said you were in Rockville, um, Maryland. So um, what are some of the trends and what has your organization been doing to help retain um, teachers of color and help to develop their skills and just basically to support them? Because I go back to, you know, what you said, and I really appreciate that. I'm gonna have to ask you to send me that quote um, about the two things that you know when you go when you come in, so take it away. So, and, and I'll say something quickly too about the the equity piece, yes, and, um, or how to how to create that spaces that sort of reflect that better. And one of the things that um, I'm read, starting to read a book called Think Again by Adam Grant, I'm an organizational psychologist, and one of the one of the things that he he talks about is. School, well, not schools, but organizations often have or leaders have support networks. And we tell folks, you want to have people who are in your corner, who are helping you to grow. Said, but we also need to have challenge networks. So we also need to solicit a diversity of thought and invite dissent because those things open up your mind Mm -hmm. and they create better better ideas in the long run. So I think that's what schools um, at the smaller level and school districts at the larger level need to do. I tell my staff, we focus a lot on anti-racism in my building, but I, I want folks to challenge me. Let's talk about CRT or let's talk about um, individual responsibility versus public policy, all those things, because that is that is a way for me to to stretch my thinking. Um, and that is that makes a better orientation for all of us. So I think that we, we shouldn't write any of us off because we have different thoughts. I think we need to bring us all into the same tent. We're family and, and we'll grow together. I think it makes us all stronger. And in terms of bond, what we saw folks, uh, men come in at all levels of career. So from administrator to teacher to paraeducator at first year or, or veterans from other school districts. And we began this, this program with us because some of us were looking around, Inger Swimson in particular, who was working in our Office of Certification at the time, back in 2013 or so. And she said, hey, come take a look at some of the numbers with me. Like folks are coming in with six, seven, 10 years experience in other places, come stay with us, transfer over here to us for two, three years and are gone before they get tenure. Like something, something's up. And mm-hmm. When we talked to the gentleman, um, uh, we did a couple of focus groups and essentially what folks told us then and what they're telling us now is they need school districts to center me. We need you to put me at the center of the conversation. So ask me what I need. Tap my shoulder for leadership positions. Provide, uh, like Daryl Howard, one of our co-leaders says, we need to, recognize the importance of mentoring, right? We need to to support the self-efficacy development of our of our teachers. Like our guys are, are saying the same things that fellows from all over the, the country are telling us. We go all over the, the country sort of talking about this work to other to one group or another. And this is the feedback that we get pretty often. It is center me, help me feel connected, help me help me grow, help me feel respected. Help me feel like I can I can be um, effic- efficacious in this in this setting, and then I'll be ready to move with you. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Now, Julia, 
you know, like everyone else on this panel, you're very accomplished and very successful. And um, I've been told that many people um, seek out your wisdom and consulting um, in other fields. So I know you're still in, you know, the school steps in the field. So what's what's making you stay in the field? And what would you share with someone who is considering leaving the profession? So it is just so interesting that you would ask me that question because I'm at a very um, strange juncture in my career. I really appreciate you, um, you know, the words that you said about people seeking out my experience and expertise because it's always something of a miracle, I think, when someone wants to give you their time and is willing to just listen to what you have to say mm -hmm. with the hope and the belief that what you say will inspire them to do better and to serve kids better. Um, in the very beginning of my career, as the only Black educator in that particular environment, I was frequently subject to folks insinuating and stating outright that the knowledge and experience I had was not enough in oh. comparison to what they had. So that's one of the reasons that I left that particular environment. Okay. So where am I now? I'm in a predominantly black and brown community. And um, due to gentrification and other things that have been happening, my school has had five different principals since 2015. Wow. And that's just in one of the schools because I serve five schools. So wow. at one time, the smallest school that had a student population of only 520 students that year had eight administrators. So that was the focus. I was brought on to be a librarian because there was no library. So they had gotten rid of the library and all we had, well, I don't want to say all we had because I want to give respect to the library professionals who are serving as paras who are often asked to do work that they don't have the credentials to do, but they still step up and are excellent anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I was asked to be the librarian, so I took that crash course in librarianship and learned how to apply my language arts teacher skills to being a librarian. And this is the long way of saying that they have closed my position. So my position will be eliminated at the end of this year. And they are going to, rather than having a teacher librarian in the role, they're gonna have two paras. And it's a very controversial decision because there is a difference actually between somebody who has the skills, knowledge, expertise of a teacher, plus that of someone with a master's in library and information science, and the library professionals who are there primarily to do clerical work, which is circulating the books and making sure that things don't get lost. Um, so, you know, that was really difficult to go from the first year the library opened and being put again on the cover of the Denver Post to now being essentially told you're, you no longer have a position at the end of this year. Now, the good news is I there is a black female principal who was not done right by within Denver Public Schools, but she used to be my principal. And we became so close that she did what the sisters do, and she hooked me up. So I will be going to um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Early College in, you know, soon, in a matter of weeks. And I'm gonna teach the 10th graders there because their teacher had a, um, a hard time. There are a lot of fights in school right now, I'm sure you've heard. And she left on FMLA and they've been doing what is called Edgenuity, which is basically like computer programs. They've been doing that for their 10th grade English ever since because the position has gone unfilled. So the situation is very, the teacher shortage is very real, which yeah. is a huge reason why I'm not leaving. Yeah. And the students definitely need me, but I also need them. I grow and learn and become a better person and educator. My praxis changes continually. The more students I connect with and the, the richer, um, we are, you know, the richer the environment that I'm in. So I'm really looking forward to going to this new environment and it's going to present some new challenges, but it's also, I think, going to have some great rewards. I know that my new principal has a phenomenal staff. She is a black female principal and she is known for her excellence. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Okay. Thank you so much, Julie. I appreciate that. And Jose. 
I want to bring it back to you and get a deeper understanding of what policies and procedures could help elevate um, the retention and recruitment of teachers of color. I want to thank you for that. I think there is a plethora of uh, spaces that are actually doing really critical work. I want to actually shout out uh, North Carolina and the Drive uh, initiative over there because they have probably the most extensive um, teacher diversity and not just diversity, but also teacher recruitment and retention uh, task force that I've seen in, in the entire country, to be honest with you. And some of the things that uh, we need to really uh, look at are one, obviously I'm seeing in the chat as well, um, salaries are critical, obviously, especially when it comes to us, because what people don't understand is that teacher, the teacher profession right now is constructed specifically for people who have the generational wealth and that second income to be able to depend on. Those of us who are on screen, for example, I don't know about y'all, but I'm, I'm kind of confident about y'all, is that we have to give money back to our parents once we graduate, right? Once we make it to that middle class, people already know. It's like, oh, you got to give money back to X, Y, and Z person. We may not have those funds, and especially if your uh, starting salary is in the uh, 20K, 30K, if that, then that becomes really hard to come by when you're going to a district that's more likely to be in an inner city and in, or in an urban space. And we know this because that's where the majority of educators of color end up being. That's one. Uh, two, we have to take a really hard look at the working conditions of teachers. And I would uh, point to the fact that working conditions for teachers are learning conditions for students. And it becomes even more so when you are in a space that um, it's already gonna be marginalized, is already, um, I guess, <laughs> I guess strapped for cash and strapped for resources when teachers have to take on uh, way more roles than they ought to. Like that becomes a real serious issue. So that's number two. I'm a big fan too, of course. You know, I know of Bond. I know of any number of Grow Your Own programs across the country. <clears throat> Those end up being phenomenal programs, specifically because they're creating spaces where people feel like they belong, right? So if you're um, a black teacher, for example, going into a school that is predominantly white, it is so much harder to stay in that school if you don't have a community. Uh, we know the work of, for example, Dr. Travis Bristol. He uh, came up with a paper just recently showing that if you had two or more uh, educators of color, uh, then you were more likely to keep those teachers because they were at least able to build the community within the school. And of course, if you do not have a community within the school, then you should go reach out to the organizations like the Grow Your Own, like the Bond, for example, like the Educator for example, uh, any number of collectives that are out there, right? And shout out to Julia too for being part of my squad. But it's almost like, ha like you need the community, right? And so if you don't have a community, then you need to go build it and you need to go find it somewhere, right? Get involved in those local organizations, get involved in those local spaces. So those would be three of my recommendations, but I have like a billion more and I'm hoping to engage in that in just a little bit, but I wanna pass the mic to my colleagues here. Okay. So one of our, um, like, um, we have a, a bond chat Slack channel where it's a, like a hundred and some of a, something of us and guys are going back and forth with me on this chat saying, hey, why aren't you mentioning this thing or that thing? And one of the, well, another thing that um, one of us pointed out is we need to, uh, the, the Center for Black Educator Development uh, recently created, led by Sharif el -Meki, they recently came out with a report about creating affirmative spaces for black teachers. And one of the elements, or they came up with five conditions and said one of them is that the curriculum should be culturally responsive. And when it's not, schools should support teachers to make it more inclusive. And what our guy Dwayne Thomas calls um, creative and innovative leadership. Like with Kenny Smith, who's one of the teachers uh, in Bond, who said he wanted to create a media literacy class or a course in his high school mm -hmm. ten, six, six, eight, ten years ago. And they allowed him to do that. His school leadership and the district leadership allowed him to do that. And then it was recreated in other schools in our school district. A few years ago, three, four years ago now, he asked to pilot a, a, um, a course uh, for high schoolers on hip hop history and culture. And school district, school building leadership was supportive school district leadership was supportive. 
And this has been the one of the most popular courses in his high school of almost 3000 students. And it's because and it's not all all students who are hip hop fans are a part of this work. It is because the students see that there are efforts to validate their identities mm -hmm. in the school spaces and they meet half. They want to meet us halfway if that's the case. And so now there are others, there are other teachers in his school who are saying, hey, how did you create that? And they don't want to create necessarily a hip hop or hip hop history and culture course. They want to create courses on programming or courses on um, AAPI history. Mm -hmm. And it's because they see that they have a space where they can be creative and supportive in that creativity. Um, in as long as it's, it supports students in the community then they are more likely to stay. Kenny says that is exactly why he got his MBCT certification. It's exactly why he stays in the school building. It's why he stayed in our school district is because he feels like he can be not just himself, but he can pull in elements of his students and their families into the work he's doing in ways that go beyond the curriculum. I love that. I love it. Julia. How about you? And then we'll see if there's any questions that we can answer. So, you know, around the policies and procedures, you know, what what can what can be done to help elevate the recruitment and retention? Well, I will tell you that we have had several experiences within Denver Public Schools where folks went from Denver physically to HBCUs and tried to recruit folks and then they come to Denver and then you know, not necessarily stay because their life was not set up without the community. It's it's the whole, you know how we always talk about the whole child where it's the whole educator experience. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to feel like I am, I am supported as a professional and I feel that way when people trust my expertise and my education. When you hired somebody, but you consistently have them doing professional development that is, condescending or not recognizing the the skill level that they were hired to have mm -hmm. i have participated or been mandated to participate in a lot of professional development that has not been good and that's one of the reasons why i'm a professional development provider because i now understand you know th what i would like to see in professional development is what i try to give people especially mm -hmm. librarians um another thing that i would say that definitely needs to happen is we need to have more open conversations about the fact that we live in a um i hope i pronounced this right is it carceral state um where you know we need to understand that it, there's no coincidence that the majority of the students in schools who are underserved and who are not having good psychological or emotional experiences in school are black and brown and the majority of the folks who are in our prison systems are black and brown. The majority of the people in the school to prison pipeline are black and brown. And yet people still don't want to talk about bias that happens in the classroom. And not all of it is unconscious. Plenty of it is mm -hmm. conscious mm -hmm. and it is emotional violence mm -hmm. that is perpetuated by policies and rules that are put in place that are not disrupted. So until if we can't have open conversations where a child can say, look, I hate this school and here's why I have been harmed over and over again. And this was my experience and it was not good, but I came out with a diploma because I did what you told me to do. If we can't listen to someone saying those truths and then actually make the changes, then we're just going to continue having these conversations for the next 60 years. Yeah. And I know that at one point I was able to sit around a table in a boardroom in a very high skyscraper in Denver with all of these black elders as part of the African American, the superintendent's African American equity task force. And these folks were sitting there and they said, I've been at this table since the 60s. Nothing wow. has changed. You know, and it was hard wow. to hear that because yeah. you come in young and full of energy and just thinking, OK, I'm going to be the one to do this monumental change. But until we actually get granular with looking at what has stayed the same 
and how the outcomes have largely stayed the same. The approaches folks are using with children of color have stayed the same. People are not reflective about the emotional violence that they perpetuate on a daily basis. The punishments and rewards that exist for learning or not learning have stayed exactly the same. The books they read have stayed for the most part the same. You know, until we're real about those things, nothing's gonna change. Especially about white supremacy. Mm -hmm. So that that's been a constant. Mm -hmm. And 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 that and that it has and I, and you know this can kind of lead us into you know we take about you know oh we got about maybe five minutes because I, I saw a couple of things um, in the chat around CRT and <laughs> I, I was gonna say it, but Jose go ahead. I, I want in. Uh, first and foremost, we, you know, this is why it's important for us to look at what history actually teaches us. So for one, uh, when we refer to ourselves as people of color, for example, we are tapping into the, the language of for folks like uh, Franz Fanon, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who used it on a plethora of occasions, and any number of racial justice advocates throughout the civil rights movement. So that's one. Secondly, is that I don't want to use the words critical race theory, not because I I want to fact check the fact that this was actually constructed by Derek Bell, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, and a plethora of legal scholars. And by the way, this is a, a theory that is used in every single accredited uh, law uh, school in the country and in, in internationally as well. It is because it has become a catch all phrase for some of the work that we must do to ensure that our education is equitable, right? We saw last year the largest demonstration in this country for civil and racial rights and human rights ever in this country. And so as a result, this catchphrase ended up being a very um, a, a, a easy way for us to not only downplay so much of what was happening with the racial uprising, but to help people revert back into status quo that was deeply inequitable and deeply oppressive for so many of us, right? And so when we use terms like CRT, we need to be very careful because even for us to say that people are teaching CRT in our public schools uh, ignites an imagination that makes people cautious of sending their kids to the schools where we serve and specifically it makes it so that you can't trust people who are more likely <laughs> even by our phenotypes more likely to teach issues of race of equity of class of gender of of, of even our lgbtqi plus issues right so when we use words that we don't really fundamentally understand we are more likely to to ignite the imagination of folks who are like, oh, well, we need to make sure people don't trust public schools and that they don't trust schooling writ large and that they don't trust black teachers. Like we've seen cases all across the country, right? Where uh, oh, black teachers are being targeted just for what they look like. And they're like, oh, CRT. Like it becomes the label by which yeah. to make sure to pull people out of the very thing that is the last and most enduring public good we have in our country and our society. So we need to be very judicious about how we talk about that. And then of course, just as an addendum, we should be trying to teach complex histories in our schools because that tends to, that tends to be the only place where we really can have a public discourse that actually has a ways and means by which to resolve those conflicts because otherwise we're not doing it very well within our public sphere and where can we where can you have a space of growth in any any part of your life a space of growth without discomfort right in order to strengthen your without discomfort you can't grow mm -hmm. so i think folks are saying don't make me don't make my children don't make the teachers uncomfortable then they're not going to grow. Like you, well, would you send if your kid said I'm uncomfortable because I'm struggling with these math facts? Would you then tell them stop because it makes you uncomfortable? No. Like this is how we get better. This is how we grow. Mm -hmm. Doing the same thing if you wanted to exercise and build some muscle. Absolutely, absolutely, Julia. I don't know if you wanted to chime in or if there were any other questions that. You know, people wanted to um, address. I just have to speak to the censorship that's happening in, in classroom and school libraries because I am, I see myself mm -hmm. first and foremost, a librarian. 
and this policing of who who gets to read what mm -hmm. and what stories are going to be represented and what are going to be buried. You know, I think it's obviously problematic for a lot of reasons, but what can educators do? So first of all, I think that what we are talking about here, a lot of what we are talking about here, the true solutions are going to have to come from the folks who are currently holding power, which the majority of them are white people. So you're gonna to need to go, white people need to go work with their other white people. Now, I have so much respect for the work that Damon and Jose have founded because you are strengthening the folks who would be beat down by the system. You know, but when we are thinking about long term solutions and when we're thinking about me having to defend whatever books I want to have in my classroom library, that doesn't happen in my urban school district. That's happening predominantly in suburbia. It's happening in predominantly white environments where folks don't want their kids to read the complete history of this nation or firsthand accounts of what has happened, genocide, things like that. So, you know, I'll be honest, I'm not gonna speak for every urban school district all over the country because I haven't been to them all, but I think that most parents who have young people of color, people of the global majority as their kids or who are caregivers for these young people, most people of color that I know of want their kids to learn their history. They want their students to read the anti-racist narratives. They want young people to discover, you know, stories of empowerment. And I think that there has to be that real reflection on the part of the white educators for why they are so afraid to stand up to people who are banning these books and just say, what you're doing is not okay. It's not okay. Mm -hmm. And we all need this knowledge. You know, Brendan Kiley has a great book called The Other Talk, where he's very vulnerable and he talks all about his experience as a white man and growing up without a sense of his racial consciousness. Mm -hmm. I think books like that need to happen a lot more often for white folks who have no sense of their own racial consciousness development because I can speak for the rest of us and say that we're, we're developing a sense of our positionality in the world or in the hierarchy of things from a very young age. And that goes for our students too. Absolutely. Well, that was a great way to close out this wonderful, wonderful panel. Uh, thank you um, on behalf of Walden University, um, Jose, Julia, and Damon for joining us um, this evening. And I thank all of our participants for your wonderful questions and participating in the chat and for joining us this evening. So thank you very much and have a good night.